Good morning. Welcome to session one of the third workshop on inflammation. And our first speaker today will be Dr. Mark Peters Golden. And after that, followed by Mark Peters Golden, we're going to have Dr. Julius Safsan's presentation about inflammatory neovascularization. At 11 o'clock, we hope. Uh, Dr. Mark Peters, uh, Dr. Mauro Teixeira will present for us about resolution of inflammation. And closing the presentation of the second day of workshop, in COVID-19 storm, COVID storm session, Dr. Lucia Falcioli will, will speak about acetylcholine and lipid mediators as biomarkers for severity in COVID-19. So, it's a great pleasure to now introduce our first speaker, Dr. Mark Peters Golden. Dr. Mark Peters Golden is a physician scientist and professor at the University of Michigan in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine since 1984. He was the Fellowship Research Director and the, and the Director for Research Training for more than 20 years at the University of Michigan. He obtained his medical degree at Duke University School of Medicine and clinical and research training in pulmonary disease at Johns Hopkins University. His research centers on the molecular and cellular biology of lung injury, inflammation, immunity, repair, and fibrosis. He is interested in lung macrophages, epithelial cells, and fibroblasts studying receptors, mediators, signaling, and transcriptional programs. Dr. Mark Peters Golden has interacted with Brazilians as collaborator and as a mentor for 20 years now. He is member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation, member also the Association of American Physicians. He was awarded by ATS, American Thoracic Society, for the scientific achievements, he published more than 250, more than 270 papers, and he has great contribution on human resource formation. So, most important, Mark is a friend, and it's an honor to have you here today in this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudio. Um, I'm hoping that you can hear me and you can see my slide. Is it, is it there? Yes, so good. Great. It's a pleasure to be here. I only wish we could be uh, live together in Rio. Mm -hmm. So I am a pulmonologist and um, I am amazed at the job that the lung has to do. It is constantly assaulted by microbes, by toxins, by allergens. And if every uh, one of these triggered an inflammatory response, the lung would not be able to carry out its functions of gas exchange and ventilation. So one of the uh, real um, questions in lung biology is to understand how inflammatory responses in that very challenging environment can be restrained. Now, if we uh, want to understand how this works at a cellular level, we need to go down, travel down the lung into the alveolus where we have two main cell types and these are going to dictate the interactions uh, that happen there and the crosstalk between them will be important. We have the epithelial cell that uh, is the main cell of the surface of the respiratory system and then we have the uh, the innate uh, immune cell of the lung, the alveolar macrophage. Now, the question that we asked that I'm going to talk about today is whether or not alveolar macrophages can secrete substances that can restrain inflammatory activation of epithelial cells. And there are many inflammatory signaling pathways that we could talk about, but the one that we're going to focus on today is the JAK-STAT pathway. And as you uh, will know, cytokines and growth factors can bind to the receptors. They can recruit 
the kinase jack to the cytoplasmic tail. It phosphorylates the transcription factor stat, which dimerizes, moves into the nucleus, and leads to the transcription of stat-dependent genes, most of which are pro-inflammatory, and chemokines are uh, the prototype examples. But like all pro-inflammatory pathways, there needs to be an endogenous uh, negative feedback loop, and that comes from another stat-dependent gene, which is a suppressor of cytokine signaling, or the SOX family of proteins, which can in turn inhibit JAK activation. Now, of this family of SOX proteins today, we're going to focus mainly on SOX3. Traditionally, it mainly inhibits the STAT3, but as you'll see, there's promiscuity here. Different SOX can inhibit different STATs. Canonically, STAT3 itself is activated by a whole variety of stimuli, but IL-6 is perhaps the best known. So the first experiment um, involves culturing alveolar epithelial cells, giving them IL-6, and then um, looking at phosphorylation of STAT3 as a readout for activation. And here you can see that IL-6 does cause phosphorylation of STAT3. However, if we pretreat the epithelial cells for one hour with condition medium obtained from resting alveolar macrophages and then give them IL-6, this activation of STAT3 is substantially attenuated. Now, I've told you that SOX proteins can be inhibitors of STAT activation, but one would not have imagined to find SOX3 in the condition medium coming from alveolar macrophages. Because at this time when we were doing this work, SOX proteins had never been identified in the extracellular space in any system. But when we took the condition medium and did a Western blot using a monoclonal antibody, we found only a single band at the appropriate weight for SOX3. To verify that this band really was the product of the SOX3 gene, we silenced SOX3 within the alveolar macrophages from which we obtained condition medium, and you can see the band going away. Functionally, to verify this, we show that the ability of condition medium to inhibit activation of STAT3 also goes away when we take condition medium from the SOX3 silenced uh, AMs. So this verifies that the alveolar macrophages are secreting SOX3 into the medium, and this is responsible for blunting activation of STAT3 in the epithelial cell. And we went on to show that we could easily find SOX3 in the basal condition medium of alveolar macrophages obtained from rats, from mice, and from humans. And likewise, we could easily detect it in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid of uh, just normal rats, mice, and humans. And despite the huge dilutional effect that occurs with lavage, it was present in nanogram concentrations, which is much higher than most cytokines are found in the alveolar fluid. Now, um, normally, uh, conventional protein secretion occurs when a leader sequence um, in the sequence of the protein targets that protein to the Golgi for conventional secretion. But none of the SOX family members have a leader sequence. So that had to suggest that there was some sort of unconventional secretion of protein going on. And among the mechanisms for unconventional secretion, we now know that extracellular vesicles are a prime uh, mechanism. So these are uh, enclosed packets that can contain various cellular material, proteins, nucleic acids, lipids. They come from uh, all, virtually all cells can release extracellular vesicles, which I'm going to call EVs, um, but they come in different flavors. Um, conventionally, we think about larger ones that bud from the plasma membrane that are called microvesicles and smaller ones that come uh, from the endosomes that we call exosomes. So um, we set about to try to ask, 
whether indeed we could show that SOX3 was contained in either of these types of EVs. And um, we, we um, isolated vesicles from the condition medium and those that were annexin-5 positive and that pelleted at 17,000 G, indicating they were a little bit larger, um, were the ones we called microvesicles. And those that were annexin-5 negative and pelleted at the higher spin, we called exosomes. And you can see here that um, virtually all of the SOX3 was present in the slightly larger so-called microvesicles. And this has been a consistent finding. And just to look at the, uh, these vesicles from the perspective of the epithelial cell, here's what, what it looks like when we label the macrophage-derived EVs with a fluorescent probe and we let them uh, in incubate on epithelial cells for one hour and just uh, do a confocal slice. And you can see all the vesicles that have been rapidly taken up by the epithelial cell. If we do this same uh, incubation at four degrees centigrade, you get no uptake, indicating that this is truly um, an endocytic energy dependent process. So um, the scheme that we have is that macrophages can package SOX3 within these microvesicles and secrete them. They can be taken up by epithelial cells where they release their SOX3 into the cytosol, which inhibits STAT activation in the epithelial cell to dampen inflammation. And one other thing that is worth um, noting that's also very interesting is that it turns out that the content of SOX3 within alveolar epithelial cells is unusually low to start with. So it kind of suggests this teleologic um, notion that because the epithelial cells themselves don't have very much SOX3, perhaps they need to acquire it from macrophages. And perhaps these two cells um, together evolved to accomplish this job of restraining inflammation in the lung. Now, one other thing that's really interesting about this SOX3 secretion is that while I've shown you that it is constitutively secreted, it also can be rapidly tuned up or down. So many of you know that we've been interested in um, the lipid mediator PGE2 for many years. Although in some contexts it's pro-inflammatory, its effects on macrophages are almost entirely suppressive. So it's interesting to see that if we incubate alveolar macrophages with PGE2, we see this very rapid, within minutes, uh, potentiation of SOX3 secretion, um, uh, which again um, is consistent with the idea of PGE2 being an anti-inflammatory molecule. Interleukin-10, another anti-inflammatory molecule, also uh, potentiates SOX3 secretion. By contrast, pro-inflammatory LPS suppresses constitutive secretion of SOX3. But we'll come back to this notion of tuning um, later. And it's also interesting to note that none of these mediators uh, that I've shown you here on this slide change either the number of EVs secreted or the intracellular levels of SOX3, indicating that the way they are modulating SOX3 secretion is that they are modulating the selective packaging of SOX3 per secreted EV. Now let's talk about some physiologic and pathologic scenarios and what happens to this, um, this normal process of SOX3 secretion by AMs. So here we're looking at cigarette smoking. We looked at a small number of uh, human subjects that were either never smokers or current smokers, but who had normal lung function and normal chest x-rays. And um, we obtained BAL fluid, um, spun out the cells, and then we sonicate that BALF um, to break up the EVs and then used an ELISA to quantify SOX3. And here you can see that as compared to the never smokers um, at 100%, the smokers had reduced um, levels of SOX3 in their BALF. We wanted to model this in mice, so we smoked mice for two hours per day and then um, sacrificed them and performed lavage. And as you can see here, 
by three days of smoke exposure, we're starting to see a reduction in SOX3 levels in BALF, which by day seven is dramatically diminished. So in both humans and mice, exposure to smoke reduces this basal secretion of SOX3. And we like to imagine that this helps to unleash inflammatory events in the smoker's lungs. Let's talk about another disease. Let's talk about asthma. Here we did a similar thing. We uh, performed lavage in uh, stable, mild to moderate asthmatics, um, did the same type of analysis. And again, you can see that SOX3 levels in BALF are reduced in the asthmatics. We also modeled this in mice. Here um, is an ovalbumin sensitization and then challenge model. Um, if we harvest uh, lavage fluid the day after uh, two successive days of allergen challenge, you can see a reduction in the SOX3 levels in BALF. We saw the same thing in a house dust mite model, which I'm not showing you. And to look at what um, macrophage-derived EVs might do to stat activation in a context that is more appropriate for asthma, we use bronchial epithelial cells rather than alveolar. And we also use stimuli that are more relevant to asthma. Here, IL-4 plus 13 or house dust mite extract. And you can see that both uh, stimuli increase activation of STAT3 relative to control. But in both instances, pre-treating the epithelial cells with um, macrophage-derived EVs blunts this um, activation of STAT3. And to this issue that I mentioned earlier of promiscuity, these same EVs also blunt STAT6 activation in response to IL-413. We next looked at actual inflammatory gene expression in these epithelial cells beyond just the uh, STAT pathway. And you can see that um, the induction of eataxin by both stimuli is blunted when we pretreat with uh, EVs, and so is the expression of TSLP. A whole variety of other cytokines were also diminished um, coming from the epithelial cell when we pretreated with macrophage derived EVs. Now, you know, one might think we could use these macrophage derived EVs as therapeutics. Um, but there are a number of theoretical limitations of trying to imagine this. First of all, the availability and the yield of these EVs um, are, are quite limited. Um, their isolation is really labor intensive. They would be immunogenic. Natural EVs comprise a non-uniform population and they contain lots of things other than SOX3, um, as you can see here. So instead we envisioned um, trying to create synthetic liposomes of uniform composition and size whose only cargo is recombinant SOX3 and which could be produced at large scale. And so we mixed together phospholipids with recombinant SOX3. We got these multilamellar vesicles, which we then extrude through a membrane to get unilamellar vesicles. These vesicles, um, or liposomes rather, had a mean size of about 100, uh, uh, 100 nanomolar, which is the same as um, what we see in our natural EVs. And these synthetic liposomes that contain SOX3 can blunt STAT activation by IL-6, um, just like the natural uh, uh, macrophage-derived EVs can. So um, we sought to administer these SOX3 liposomes um, in vivo. Um, and the way we did this in our OVA model was we administered SOX3 two hours prior to the two challenges with OVA on days seven and eight, and then again harvested lavage fluid at day nine. Here's eosinophil numbers. You can see that they go up with OVA um, in mice that got the empty liposomes, but administration of the SOX3 liposomes reduces the number of eosinophils. This happens in both female and male mice. We also see the same response if we look at IL-4 levels. And not showing you this, but SOX3 liposomes in this model also reduced the numbers of neutrophils. 
levels of a whole variety of other cytokines and also polarization of macrophages to both M1 and M2 phenotypes. The next model that I wanna show you and the, uh, the last disease model is lung cancer. So um, the STAT, uh, the JAK STAT pathway is implicated not just in inflammation, but in tumorigenesis. And here you can see that um, in subjects who turned out um, when they had a bronchoscopy to look for, uh, to diagnose a lung nodule, turned out to have non-small cell lung cancer, they too had lower baseline levels of SOX3 in their valve. We likewise sought to model this in mice. Here we're using a KRAS mutant mouse that where the mutation gets activated by intrapulmonary administration of adenoviral CRE. Um, and in this model, um, you end up with multiple lung adenocarcinomas by 16 weeks. Here we measured SOX3. We did this in BALF, but what I'm showing you here is SOX3 levels in the condition medium from AMs isolated from these mice. And you can see that not only is SOX3 down at week 16 when there are multiple tumors, but it's already starting to come down at week eight, eight weeks before you see visible tumors. We then went to look at the ability of the SOX3 liposomes to inhibit tumor growth. And we did this in a xenograft uh, subcutaneous model where we inoculate A549 lung cells subcutaneously in mice. It takes about four weeks to get visible tumors, at which point we then started injecting them every few days with either empty liposomes or SOX3 containing liposomes. And here you can see, this is the starting tumor volume um, after four weeks. In the mice that received empty liposomes, tumors gradually grow. But in mice that received the SOX3 liposomes into their tumor, you can see that there's no growth. This is what the tumors look like grossly. And then when we look histologically, the, uh, the tumors that received intratumoral injection of SOX3 liposomes you can see that rather than a sheet, a uniform sheet of tumor cells, there's lots of open space, which are areas of apoptosis um, where we've killed tumor cells with SOX3. So having shown these, that, that SOX3 is reduced, the SOX3 secretion is reduced in a number of conditions, um, what's the mechanism? And this is of course um, a, a really interesting question, but a really challenging one. Let me just show you some uh, as yet unpublished data that begins to give us some clues. So I wanna talk about metabolism in AMs. So resting alveolar macrophages are quite unusual as compared to other macrophages in that they exhibit an unusually low level of glycolysis. And a variety of inflammatory states, as many of you will know, are associated with enhanced glycolysis. So we wondered if perhaps enhanced glycolysis might mediate the impaired SOX3 secretion that we see in inflammatory conditions. And so here we used a different model. Um, here we're gonna look at GMCSF, a pro-inflammatory cytokine that as you can see, also reduces SOX3 secretion in AMs. But if we culture these AMs with 2-deoxyglucose, which substitutes for glucose and prevents glycolysis, this inhibition uh, caused by GMCSF is completely overcome. So uh, GMCSF can only inhibit SOX3 secretion if glucose is present. So we then got interested in glucose metabolism, and I'm not going to show you a lot of data here, but I'm gonna summarize a lot of data in which we traced um, the flow of glucose through into pyruvate, into the mitochondria, where it generates citrate, which then leaves the mitochondria, goes into the cytosol, and then gets converted to acetyl-CoA by this enzyme, uh, ATP citrate lyase. And I'm just gonna show you what happens if we inhibit this ACLY enzyme. Again, we overcome the GMCSF inhibition. And I'm not gonna show you that if we inhibit the CTP or the MPC, we get the same results. 
So we believe that ultimately um, glucose needs to end up being converted to acetyl-CoA in order to see this inhibition of SOX3 secretion. Now, how increases in acetyl-CoA inhibit the packaging of SOX3 remains unknown. But we speculate that acetyl-CoA is causing acetylation of either SOX3 itself or of some chaperone molecule responsible for its entry into EVs. That is work uh, still in progress. But of course, it raises the question of, is this mechanism responsible for the in vivo dysregulation of secretion we see in conditions like lung cancer or asthma? Again, work in progress. But I do want to emphasize that these are the first data that we know of to show a role for metabolism in controlling secretion of, a, of any EV cargo molecule um, in any cell context. So in conclusion, um, delivery of SOX3 protein from AMs to ECs, uh, we believe is an important means by which inflammatory and tumorigenic responses in the lung are restrained. The packaging of SOX3 into EVs can be modulated by a whole variety of factors and mechanisms, many of which we still don't understand. We believe that dysregulation of SOX3 secretion might actually be important in contributing to a variety of inflammatory disease states since it is basically a, a loss of this critical restraint. And finally, we're interested in the notion that intrapulmonary administration of synthetic uh, vesicles that encapsulate recombinant SOX3 could have therapeutic potential. So I want to acknowledge um, lots of people. I don't have time to talk about them individually but a number of people uh, from my lab um, who worked on this project, a number of collaborators at the University of Michigan, and I want to acknowledge funding sources. So thank you very much and be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Oh, actually, Gustavo, uh, it's a logical no, is. <laughs> yeah. no, it's going to work. <laughs> okay. A little bit of bad air, but uh, we are back. Okay, thank you, Gustavo. Thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation. It's really uh, impressive how this subject of this cross-talking is going on and on. Uh, we have some, some questions already here in the comments of the YouTube. Gustavo, can you please put the first question of Lucas Bolini? Yes. But... Yeah, so... Um question about um, crosstalk involving AMs with SOX3 and ILC2 cells. And um, the short answer is I have no idea. We haven't looked at this, but, um, you know, of course, um, the SOX3 coming from AMs um, would be expected to be taken up by other cells as well, um, not just um, epithelial cells, because um, the mechanism in, in epithelial cells is not a receptor-dependent mechanism. It's it's just endocytosis. And so we would imagine that um, there could be, this mechanism could lead to crosstalk with lots of other cell types, um, uh, but we have not uh, looked at ILCs. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question from Mauro Teixeira. He's, in, uh, he's asking, uh, SOX is an intracellular protein. Could delivery of SOX via small vesicles eventually develop an anti-SOX3 immunotherapy, uh, immune response? Do you mean um, an allergic response uh, that would uh, then impede its utility? Is, is that what you're 
I think that's what maybe you're referring to. Um, I mean, of course, it's it's possible. Um, you know, we would be giving human recombinant SOX3 to humans. Um, so I, you know, I would hope not, but, <clears throat> um, but you know, you don't know these things until you actually try. So um, theoretically, it's possible. Gotcha. Uh, I have one question, Mark. Uh, what happened with the lungs of the SOX3 knockout mice at basal level without channel? Do we have some sort of inflammatory process going on? Yeah, so this is a really complicated question and one that we struggled with at the very, when we very first got into this. Um, you'll notice that I showed no data with SOX3 knockout mice, right? And the problem uh, with SOX3 knockout mice is that, of course, they will not be able, their macrophages will not be able, and even, even if you did, um, you know, tried to engineer, you know, with a Lysam Cree, uh, a macrophage specific mm -hmm. or a leukocyte specific, specific uh, SOX3 deletion, of course, those macrophages would not be capable of secreting SOX3, but they also would not express intracellular SOX3. So if you saw uh, a loss, you know, if you saw enhanced inflammation in these mice, which of course have been described in, in SOX knockouts many, many times, you wouldn't be able to, you know, it'd be hard to distinguish whether that was because of decreased SOX secretion or decreased intracellular SOX in the AM. So to be to be honest, because of that problem, you know, we never actually um, we never actually pursued that approach, um, um, you know, because it's so complicated. Gotcha. And and uh, I was wondering if this uh, synthetic way to 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 deliver sucks that it, that you make, if you have a side effect on on enhancing infections. Is it possible? Yeah. So we actually, um, we've only done a little bit of work with this system in the context of infection. And um, it doesn't look, it didn't look like SOX3 um, really was um, that important, in, in at least in, in Klebsiella. But SOX1, on the other hand, is. Um, so, um, so, you know, as I said, we haven't um, explored this um, thoroughly, but, um, uh, you know, there is a difference. SOX1 seems to be more important for host defense than SOX3. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I, I'm not seeing other questions. No, there is one here from Josiane Neves. Uh, SOX3. It's already there. Yeah, could would SOX3 um, vesicles modulate eosinophils directly? I would imagine so. Um, but again, we have not looked at this. Um, it's kind of the same answer as I gave for ILCs. Um, you know, in our hands, this uptake is a pretty nonspecific. People do talk about targeting um, vesicles or liposomes um, to particular recipient cells um, by targeting particular receptors. But in, in the, at least in, in, with epithelial cells, we show that this, was, this uptake is not receptor dependent. Um, whether, you know, how broadly it, it would extend to other cells though, we honestly have not looked at. So um, it's a good question. Okay, so I think that we can end with this first talk, and I would like to thank you once again, Mark, for the opportunity to, to listen to your data. Very interesting, always very, very pleasure for us to have you here. So My next year, I hope to, to have you here and give a big hug on you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo.
Hello, uh, good morning to Dr. Mark Peters Golden, Julio Schafstein, Mauro Teixeira, Lucia Faccioli, and to everybody in the attendance of this great session on immunology in the third edition of the workshop on inflammation. It's my honor to chair the next two presentations, and I would like to thank the organizing committee and the presenters for the privilege to be here today. I will start with the presentation of Dr. Julio Schafstein. Dr. Julio has a chemistry degree from the Israel Institute of Technology and is a PhD from the New York University, supervised by Professor Victor Nussenbein, where he described the C4 binding protein. When he returned to Brazil, he joined the Biophysics Institute at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and the lab of Dr. Marcelo Basinski, where he started to study the immunopathogenesis of Chagas disease and is currently a professor of immunology. Dr. Schafstein is also a member of the Brazilian National Academy of Sciences and a recipient of many prizes acknowledging his scientific contributions. He and his laboratory described cruzipine, the main, main cysteine protease and an important virulence factor of T. cruzi. The activity of uh, cruzipine is regulated by another protein described by Dr. Shafting's lab, the cysteine protease inhibitor Shagazin. These studies led to the description of bradykine formation in its role in T. cruzine infection and Chagas disease. Dr. Shafstein has been studying the calicrine kinin system in the integration mechanisms between innate and adaptive immunity for the past several years. Today, we are going to hear Dr. Shafstein talk about his work that combines several experimental approaches, including molecular and intravital microscopy, to study neovascularization during the inflammatory response and its impact on the survival strategies of intracellular protozoa. Dr. Shafstein, Please. Thank you so much, Bruno, for the overview of uh, our uh, recent experience uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, we, we share, we work in the same institute, and it's, uh, it's a, a tremendous pleasure for me. Uh, I, I must uh, recognize, uh, I'm honored with the invitation. Thank you, uh, Josiane Neves and Claudia Benjamin for the opportunity to, to share uh, with students and the general audience what we have been working in the, in the past few years. Uh, I'm starting my presentation with a vision that certainly is shared by all of us that are looking forward for the moment to see uh, Rio de Janeiro back uh, to what it was in the past, but perhaps uh, much better if we uh, are fortunate enough to get the political changes that we need in the country in order to uh, move science ahead as we all wished. Uh, the reason that I think people that are not acquainted with Chagas disease might, might find interest in the story that I'm going to tell has to do with a general interest of this type of approach, which is very, very classical, so you are not going to see very sophisticated uh, technology involved in this process, but it's just using classic intravital microscopy to investigate the impact of dysregulated inflammation. And in our case, uh, the focus was on the dysregulation of proteolytic networks, uh, uh, including uh, complement and the calicrine kinin system, as Bruno has mentioned in his introduction. Um, I think that although we have basically uh, worked on a T. cruzi infection, uh, there is room and opportunities for experts that are working with other intracellular parasites such as Leishmania and Toxoplasma gondii, for example, uh, to explore, to take advantage of the model that we have developed. And you are all invited to come to our lab and learn the technique and the system because it's not too expensive and maybe worth uh, uh, investing for the future uh, under the premise that uh, uh, research in Brazil will also support development of transgenic animals and also tools to uh, study immunology and inflammation in the hamster, uh, which is certainly now gain 
uh, more visibility because of the advances on SARS-CoV uh, infection. I think that even those that are not involved with in parasites and viruses may be interested in studying and using the system to study tissue tolerance in sterile inflammation, such as malignant uh, metastatic tumor and toxic drugs such as bleomycin that is a, a very, very potent fibrotic uh, compound uh, that is being currently also explored uh, in our lab together with uh, Claudia Benjamin. Uh, basically, the idea that uh, uh, we are going to uh, uh, discuss in this presentation have to do with the outcome of a very, very dramatic uh, process of infection. In our case, this is an intracellular parasite, T. cruzi, that is replicating and transforms into the flagellated infected forms in the cytoplasm and cells undergo inflammatory death, releasing uh, trypomacigotes, a large number of trypomacigotes to the interstitial spaces. And these parasites, they are not only infective, but they, also, they are extremely pro-inflammatory they have GPI anchors uh, that are potent activators of TOL2. <clears throat> and what we have done in the past was to develop models to study the physiopathological consequence of the activation of innate immunity via TOL2. And we showed that this process is integrated by feedback loops of amplification of proteolytic cascades in which perivascular mast cells play a very critical role in this process. Obviously, I'm not going to discuss what we have published in the past because I want to move on and tell you more about some aspects that may be relevant for those that have a, 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 a strong interest uh, in the pathogenesis of the chronic infection because people have described for many, many years that there are some uh, 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 unexplained uh, microcirculatory abnormalities in the heart of patients that developed uh, chronic Chagazid cardiomyopathy. This is after several years of a very, very low-grade infection. The immune system controls acute infection, but is not able to eliminate the parasites. So after several years, about 30% of the patients develop a uh, very, very severe progressive cardiomyopathy. So people have been working also in mice, uh, modeling this process. There is evidence for endothelin one upregulation in cardiomyocytes being, uh, uh, playing a pivotal role in the pathogenesis in the mouse system. And there are uh, selected uh, attempts to study the outcome of the lesions caused by the parasites, uh, including angiogenesis such as work that was performed in Brazil by the group from uh, André Talvani, uh, uh, which showed that uh, uh, the, the infective forms of uh, trypomacigotes, which are the infective forms, they release antigens that in the sponge model can induce angiogenesis. <clears throat> in our case, we are, for the first time, we just submitted uh, a long paper, uh, which uh, we are showing for the first time something that you, you might say, but this is obvious, you know. Uh, if you have a system in which you can see uh, this parasite infecting uh, stromal cells uh, after a, a single cycle of infection, which usually lasts about five to seven days, it is predictable that you will have uh, inflammatory lesions and the tissue should undergo uh, remodeling. Uh, so repair systems should be present, and uh, one should expect to see neovascularization happening in the system. Uh, in order to see those uh, phenomena, which are predictable, uh, you, we had to develop tools for that. And uh, uh, basically what I'm going to show you is how this can be accomplished using the hamster cheek pouch model, which very few people are familiar with. Uh, I'm just advancing here uh, the working hypothesis, the model, uh, because I think it will help the students, especially the young students, to understand what we are talking about. And so this is a model that will help you 
to understand every piece of information that I will present in this presentation, okay? Basically, what we have is a situation in which we uh, uh, inject uh, parasites that are released from infected cells in vitro, okay? The parasites are injected in the uh, tissue, which is the hamster cheek pouch tissues. The hamster has two cheek pouches, so you can inject parasites in one cheek pouch, and you can inject PBS, uh, which is the uh, vehicle, uh, in the second pouch. And then you can follow longitudinally uh, the transitions that are taking place in the tissues. So what we saw basically, and you will see the data, is that after a, a few days, during the period in which the parasites are starting to replicate in the cytoplasm, you can already see a very, very subtle inflammation. You cannot see a massive infiltration of leukocytes at that point, but if you do a very, very delicate intravital microscopy, you can see that leukocytes labeled with rhodamine, they are infiltrating the tissues already at very early stages of infection. And then there is a gradual transition. There is obviously a, 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 a blatant angiogenesis taking place at seven days because the infection is asynchronous. I mean, you have first waves of parasites that are being released from the infected cells. And these parasites, as shown in my first figures, they can further stimulate angiogenesis in a way that you finally get a full blown up uh, 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 angiogenesis and neovascularization in the tissue. So this is basically what you are going to see. Uh, we made a very important modification in the methodology that was extensively used as of uh, 2006. And this would not have been possible if I would not have counted was a collaboration of a Swedish investigator, Professor Eric Svenjo, uh, that came to Brazil. And he is a pioneer in the development of this model. And I had this privilege of having his uh, presence in our lab, implementing a model that in the first stages only involved topical sensitization of the exposed cheek pouch to pathogens. And we have published several papers uh, uh, discussing uh, the role of the calicrine kinin system and the interaction with the toll to uh, 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 stimulating uh, uh, immunity uh, uh, using the combination of this model, which obviously can only be uh, uh, explored uh, using pharmacological tools at this moment because we don't have transgenic hamsters, right? But then taking advantage of the lessons that came from this model to do the proper experiments in transgenic mice to look on immune responses and other aspects of inflammation. So we have done you know, a lot of studies on, on, on that system, but there is a very important limitation. It is impossible to follow the pathogenic outcome of the manipulation that you do in the microcirculation because you are using a topical model. You are just stopping the flow uh, of the superficies for uh, three or four minutes, and then you add the pathogen or you add the pharmacological uh, uh, drugs that you want to manipulate the inflammatory response. Uh, but the, 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 the answers that they are anesthetized, they must be sacrificed after two hours, so you cannot see the outcome. So after two 2017, we were able to get access to GFPT Cruzi, and Eric uh, uh, spent a lot of time trying to find a way to gently inoculate uh, uh, the pathogens in the uh, hyaluronic acid mantle that covers the hamster cheek pouch. And we succeeded, so this can be done with naive hamsters or can be done also with immune hamsters or infected hamsters. As I said, you can always use the contralateral pouch as a control, and you can study longitudinally. And we had, of course, to develop methodologies to measure the impact of uh, anti-inflammatory drugs or, or anti-angiogenic drugs 
uh, uh, in the uh, uh, cheek pouch system. So this is basically uh, uh, the uh, uh, design that you will see uh, uh, in, in this presentation. So uh, you can either infect the uh, left tissue with wild type parasites. Uh, we count on GFP labeled, GFP engineered parasites of the same strain. We also have luciferase and we have the non-virulent insect epimesigol GFP as a control uh, to study the impact of the uh, infection itself on the inflammatory neovascularization that uh, you are going to see. Uh, <clears throat> on three days after infection, which is a moment where the parasites are already replicating, but it's not, not too extensive. It's just the beginning of the proliferation of the parasites. You can measure the indexes, indexes of pro-inflammation and indexes of angiogenesis. And you can do several other uh, analyses, including proteomics, to see whether we could identify molecular components that could participate at early stages of the inflammatory uh, of, of the angiogenic process, which is full blown when you finally reach at seven days. And this gave us the opportunity to make the uh, uh, pharmacological uh, intervention, uh, which we used, and this is very important, we use benzidazole. It's a trypanocidal drug that is being used in the clinics, but there is a very important critical difference in the protocol. Here, we are only starting the procedure 24 hours after infection, meaning that we are not interfering with the parasite ability to invade the cells in the stromal tissues. We are only interested to follow the outcome of the intracellular development, how this impacts how this translates into microcirculatory change, if this is the case. So this is what we have done. Uh, the techniques, there is no time to discuss the algorithms and the methodology that was uh, elegantly uh, developed by uh, Pablo Blanco and Carlos Bulant at LNCC, CNPq, our collaborators. And this has been absolutely fundamental for the success of the uh, work. So what you're seeing here is basically the, uh, the outcome. If you look at seven days, you can see uh, uh, even on uh, eight, naked eye, you can see uh, several lesions and evidence for angiogenesis. Uh, if you look for GFP aggregates, patches, uh, there are, they are hundreds of tiny patches presumably uh, consisting of dead parasites. We cannot distinguish whether they are live or dead parasites, but there is a clear correlation between successful infection and presence of very, very numerous uh, aggregates in the cheek pouch. At this point, you can see, as already mentioned early on, a very, very blown up angiogenesis in the tissue as compared to the controls or which uh, here, here you can see the contralateral, the contralateral pouch. <coughs> so uh, uh, the contralateral pouch. You can see that due to asynchronic infection, uh, there is still many, many parasites that are still viable within cells at this stage. And of course, uh, you might predict that once the parasites are released in the intertissue space, uh, what could be the outcome? And this is a very interesting question because the group from Tatiana Bizova uh, at Cleveland, uh, they have recently described and extended a paper that was published uh, on Nature about uh, 11 years ago, uh, this year showing that uh, knockout mice that have told two deficient exclusively in endothelial cells, they are responsive to dumps, oxidized lipids generated by, my, presumably generated by myeloperoxidase associated to nets. <clears throat> and so here we have an opportunity perhaps of having two synergistic effects 
on the endothelial cells via TOL2. And this is, of course, this is going to be part of future studies involving dubs and involving the TGPI anchors that are expressed and contain in extracellular vesicles, very similar to what Dr. Uh, Peter Gordon has uh, uh, presented to us in the previous presentation. Uh, if we just look at the spreading of the parasites with luciferase, uh, we can see that the, the parasites are disseminated. Uh, they leave the cheek pouch after seven to 14 days. They disappear from the cheek pouch. Uh, sometimes there is a residual infection, but they can spread to different tissues including the heart, and here using uh, uh, quantitative PCR, we can see uh, extensive uh, a presence of the parasites uh, in the heart of a few hamsters. Not every outbred hamster will have the same effects. Uh, the tissue is extremely inflamed at seven days. Uh, we don't know whether this has a connection also with activities uh, produced by nets. Uh, including uh, the previously mentioned mechanism of production of uh, TOL2, endogenous ligands for TOL2. This is an open question, <clears throat> but uh, and very important, as I said in the beginning, was our ability to measure uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the outcome of, of the pharmacological treatments that we have made so we use benzinidazole in order to uh, target exclusively the intracellular, uh, intracellular parasites. And obviously, you cannot follow all the different indexes that are uh, shown in this graph. But Pablo Blanco and Carlos Bulan developed uh, a, a PCI projection, use a classifier that makes our life much easier because it tells us about the complexity of the microvascular bed at day, seven days after the infection. And what we can see here is that a cheek pouch that was inoculated with a non-infective stage, the epimesigols, they all fall uh, in the green group, which is representative of the steady state of the hamster cheek pouch. Uh, then when we infect with the triple goals that are pro-inflammatory and infective. But remember, starting the treatment only 24 hours after infection, so the trips, they had comfortable time in order to infect cells. But then we started the treatment with benzidazole. It's a daily treatment. You know, the most of the components uh, in the PCI projection go through the uh, towards the, the, the steady state condition, indicating that Benzinidazole by targeting parasites that are in the intracellular stage, they can have an anti inflammatory effect. They reduce not only inflammation, but they also reduce uh, 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 the uh, uh, plasma leakage. And uh, 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 I think that I'm, I'm about, about to uh, end my time uh, just uh, to show you that if we measure using intravital microscopy, the infiltration of leukocytes at day three, as mentioned before, there is a very subtle infiltration. And very interestingly, this is translated by increases, subtle increases in plasma leakage that obviously is further increased as the inflammatory lesions uh, 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 tend to increase uh, during the life cycle of the parasite. This very delicate uh, leakage of plasma uh, uh, is, is, is very, very interesting uh, for the following reasons. Uh, at this point, I have to make tribute to the people that are contributing to the field. And for example, there is a very interesting paper by the group from Santuza uh, at uh, Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, uh, Oliveira et al. plus pathogen this year, showing a transcriptoma in vitro with fibroblast and the stromal tissues of the hamster, they are extremely rich on fibroblast. 
uh, they show with human fibroblasts that early stages of infection, when the amacigals are replicating, they can see secretion of neutrophil attracting chemokines, indicating that innate immunity is sensing the replicating parasites. And this is being translated as secretion of chemokines that can attract neutrophils. And presumably, this is associated to microvascular leakage. Why microvascular leakage may, be, may benefit the parasite? This is a very interesting uh, 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 possibility because there are extensive work done by Claudia Paiva and Marcelo Bosa, uh, also from Brazil and Rio de Janeiro, showing evidence that transferring <clears throat> that iron transfer to macrophage are able to increase ROS and ROS in turn can fool the uh, infectivity of intracellular T. cruzi uh, in, 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 in the mouse model that they have extensively worked. So it's interesting to think about the possibility that, that the plasma transport of transferrin could actually be uh, 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 profitable for the macrophage uh, in, 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 the, in the tissues. There is another important paper showing that pro-survival archetype pathway uh, is important for the parasite replication. So the parasite must, it must prevent abortive infection. So having the availability of pro-survival factors that may be generated following proteolysis can be extremely useful. <clears throat> uh, um, I think that my time is over. Is that correct? Bruno. Yes, yes, Dr. Julia. My time is over. So, yeah. uh, uh, in order, just, just, just the summary of the results, <clears throat> because at the last stage of the talk, uh, uh, I, I think that hopefully you will see this paper published at some point. You will see that using proteomics, we identify chymase as the most prevalent component of the. Uh, inflamed tissues at day three of infection. And this is a very interesting finding because chymase is a profibrotic serine protease stored in mast cell secretary granules. And we used uh, two different uh, inhibitors of chymase, uh, chymostatin, which is not so specific, but also Thai 1, uh, Thai 516A, which was developed by uh, Professor uh, uh, by Japan uh, collaborators, showing that it is able to uh, inhibit T. cruzi induced inflammatory neovascularization. There are several interesting aspects related to the pathogenesis that is worth discussing, but hopefully, in another opportunity, we can uh, get uh, this problem uh, discussed in greater depth. Uh, because the time is too short uh, to cover all aspects that were covered in this publication that we just submitted last week. Okay, thank you very, very much uh, for the opportunity to summarize uh, the story. And I hope that you find some interest in working in the future with a hamster chick pouch. Hopefully in 10 years, you will have transgenic hamsters and all the tools that are necessary in order to make this model uh, a very important contribution uh, to uh, the scientific community in Brazil and elsewhere. Thank you. All right, Dr. Julio, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Uh, we have time for uh, a few uh, questions. Uh, we'll actually uh, start uh, asking you to comment on how common, how uh, widespread is this uh, strategy of parasites uh, to uh, mobilize the plasma components uh, uh, in their own benefit for the, for the infection. And also, if you could comment on the co-evolutionary impact of parasites targeting the host resolution and repair system to co-opt the immune system and establish their infection. Thank you. I think it's, you know, uh, absolutely. You are uh, right on, on the spot. 
you know, the, these are very, very fundamental questions. And I think that this is what is so interesting in the, in the model itself. It really provides an opportunity to, to dissect uh, the dynamics of this process, even if it was shown in such a limited way, because we only covered one cycle of intracellular development of the parasite. We did a very, very uh, punctual uh, experiment with Leishmania, which I think that for uh, disseminated Leishmaniasis, uh, it will be worth exploring the system, you know. Toxoplasma gondii probably will be also uh, tested in our lab because we have a student that is already working, but not in the hamster model. So I think that generalization uh, uh, may occur, but we need time and, and thank you for the question. All right. Uh, I actually have uh, uh, another question from Claudio Canetti. What is the role of uh, cystineal leukotrienes during the leak process during infection? And uh, I will actually uh, uh, also uh, uh, put uh, an addition of mine. And uh, regarding mast cells, you mentioned that uh, chymase is uh, uh, an important uh, factor produced by mast cells. But mast cells can also produce, produce cystineal leukotrienes. They also store uh, histamine and other uh, vasoactive uh, uh, mediators. So uh, can you comment on well, that? Well, this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a very important question because uh, the mast cells, they are located, localized perivascularly. I didn't have time to show the image, but uh, this is a very good model to look at mast cell function. Uh, and, and, and there is a, another interesting point in that regard because we see at day three already an increased presence of uh, uh, mast cells using toluidine blue uh, staining. Uh, in, in three days, it's not sufficient time to have recruitment of precursors that are already differentiated. So uh, the conclusion is that probably we are having in situ differentiation, terminal differentiation of the mast cells. At that point, of course, they will contribute also with cysteine leukotrienes and with all this uh, myriad of uh, components that participate in the process. We are at this point uh, focusing on the proteolytic networks uh, for reasons that have to do with the history of the lab. Uh, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a very promising uh, model. Uh, and I hope that Claudio Canetti will implement this in your lab so that we could really look on, on, on the function of leukotriens as, as, as we already discussed in the past. I think that uh, it's, it's feasible. It's feasible. It's not a big investment. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Julio Sharfstein. Very nice talk. Uh, uh, that's all the time that uh, we had for questions for now. And uh, I will actually uh, move on to Dr. Mauro Teixeira, who is uh, MD from Federal University of Minas Gerais and got his PhD at the University of London that was followed by a postdoctoral period at the National Heart and Lung Institute. Upon his return to Brazil, Mauro was hired at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, where he is currently a full professor at the Department of Biochemistry and Immunology. He is a member of the National Academy of Science and National Order of Scientific Merit, both in Brazil, and is a member of the British Pharmacological Society and the World Academy of Sciences. He is also a member of the editorial board of the British Journal of Pharmacology and many other journals in the area of inflammation and pharmacology. He's a vice president of the Brazilian National Academy of Sciences and president of the Brazilian Society of Inflammation. He's one of the most prominent researchers in Brazil and has published more than 650 papers that were cited in excess of 24,000 times. He's the head of, uh, of a large group interested in the study of inflammation, the context of infection and serial inflammation. More recently, he has been focused in the study of the role of inflammation host microbial interaction and developing novel inflammation-based therapies to treat infection, in particular, arboviral and protozoal infections. Today, we are going to, to hear about one of Dr. Teixeira's many interests, the mediators and mechanisms involved in resolution of inflammation and its potential uh, therapeutic implications during viral diseases. Dr. Teixeira, please. Okay, Bruno, thank you very much. Just confirm you hear me well. Yeah. 
Okay. So, um, so first of all, thanks for the uh, kind uh, presentation. Would also like to thank Claudia and, and, and Josie for the invitation to be here and present. So I'm in a very remote place. You don't want to know where I am, but yeah, in a very remote place. So bear with me with my internet connection. So Gustavo, if you need, you may switch off the camera. So I will talk to you briefly in the next 20 minutes or so about this area of research in the lab, which is resolution of information and how we can harness it to treat, uh, eventually treat infection. So we've been working with the concept of host a microbial interaction. So you can imagine a virus infecting a human being. There could be contact and establishment. You know, the infection can be productive, so, i.e. there is replication of the microorganism. And that eventually may cause disease. And I think that's a very important separation that infection and disease are different entities. Disease is clinical presentation of an infection and not everyone has it. And you, you, you can actually separate that and, and separate actually human microbial interactions in, in, in various subsets. So to be honest, most of the time, we don't interact with the microbial world. We, so we are absolutely surrounded by microbes, which we do not interact. We do not have the co-receptors. So there, there cannot be productive interaction. The, the most important, uh, interaction we have then is with resident microbiota, which is mostly in the intestine, but also in, in skin, in the, in the upper airways, you know, everywhere you have contact with the outside. Uh, I will not dwell at all here, but that is absolutely important for our ability to interact with the outside. Then there can be infection. As I told you, an infection may lead to disease and death. From the medical point of view, we almost look at this from the top to bottom. We are obviously more interested in death and in infections that cause death, death or significant disease. So we've been trying to sort of work with this concept that disease is different from infection and maybe trying to find out ways of presenting new treatments for infection. After this, that during infection, you know, the interaction between the microorganism and its host will lead the production of mediators of inflammation and mediators uh, of the immune response. And these mediators we believe are important to first contain the infection, you know, for this initial infantry response, and then to drive the ensuing adaptive immune response. So that is what we believe is the role of the immune response. So most of us would actually think that preventing inflammation will actually prevent immune responses from happening. That's not really the case, actually, because disease is frequently a continent and due to excessive production of mediators, or, or as I put here, inadequate, inadequate production of mediators of the front response. So in several instances, disease is actually the result of the process that was there to start with to control infection. But when it's insufficient, let's say in HIV, excessive and misplaced as in sepsis, for example, or altered in which the mediators are different, that could actually drive the immune response. So for many years, we have been trying to identify, you know, host molecules that are differentially expressed during infection and those which are the mediators that actually cause disease and whether we can separate mediators that cause disease from those that are necessary for protective immunity. So, because if we can differentiate these two groups of mediators, we can eventually find these strategies that prevent excessive inflammation. I think COVID actually brought a lot of light into this. So we've found several molecules, but you know, this is somehow new that we can actually treat infection uh, with anti-inflammatory drugs. We've been working with this for at least 15 years now, and these are some of the reviews and I just call attention to that one in which we, we were already discussing, in which those graphs that I showed you are, are, are presented, which you actually have the possibility of development of anti-inflammatory drugs for infectious disease. Obviously, we all caught up by COVID and it, it has brought huge interest in the field because indeed we can treat uh, uh, COVID-associated inflammatory response with anti-inflammatory drugs. 
Why so? Because, you know, in COVID, you have this very distinct, uh, uh, perhaps two or, or, or some people even say more, uh, parts of, uh, of the infection in which you actually have viral replication that actually mostly mild with some degree, you know, mild, but also with a lot of suffering from the point of view of you know, tiredness and et cetera, because there is a, a, a an, infections, uh, an infection going on. But as the immune system kicks in, there is a marked inflammatory response that actually will drive the severe critical illness and eventually may, may uh, lead to death. And you can actually see this as two ways of treating in which antiviral therapies would be beneficially very early on and then followed by a, a, a period where most likely anti-inflammatory therapies would be more beneficial. And in fact, as this is really difficult to separate within a particular patient, ideally we would kick in and treat patients with antiviral therapies with anti-inflammatory therapies. It, it, it's not clear which ones we should be using, but that's the concept. So putting it in another way, as infection goes down, there is this inflammatory phase that is amenable to treating with drugs such as under L6, steroids, etc. Now, this is very similar to what we see in dengue as well and influenza. So, you know, although there is sort of this awe about uh, COVID, this is pretty much what we have seen with many other viral infections. Okay, so that said, and I'm, I'm, I'm keeping in mind that inflammation is very important for driving the disease in certain viral infections. So how, how do we actually understand the inflammatory response to these diseases and how we develop drugs to treat that? So obviously a lot of initial energy has been uh, uh, trying to understand how leukocytes arrive or accumulate in tissues. And we are interested in that because it's the arrival of leukocytes that drive the functional loss of, of, of tissues. Now, in, in, in the last few years, what we realized is not, maybe it's not only important to study to, to understand the arrival of leukocytes, but also how we, got, we get rid of them, how these leukocytes are eliminated from tissue in a good way. So how is inflammation resolved, right? So, uh, this is a recent review from us. We've written a few reviews on the, on, on the subject. And I think what I want to, to actually, uh, you know, give you as a message today is that not only the arrival of cells is mediator driven and it takes a lot of energy, but also the resolution of inflammation is mediator driven. So resolution is absolutely active and we need chemical signals to do that. This is what we call the mediators of resolution. Uh, with that, because you know we need mediators and it's active, you know we can see chronic inflammation and even maybe acute infection and acute inflammation, you know, occurring in excessive way. Not only because there's an excessive arrival, there is enhanced arrival and recruitment of cells, but because also because there could be a defect, a derangement in the resolution process. So if acute, that would lead to excessive acute inflammatory response. In the chronic setting, that would also drive you that chronic persistent inflammatory response. So, you know, put that in, in, in graphic form, under normal circumstances, after a stimulus, there is arrival of cells, leukocyte recruitment, leukocytes arrive in tissue, they do what whatever was you know they deal with the stimulation that you know set them to go there and then there is active resolution of inflammation now if there is failed resolution if for any reasons mediators are not formed or cells are not responding to those mediators inflammation does not resolve so can we make that better can we induce resolution of inflammation in chronic inflammation or acute infection inflammation and if so what are the molecules that do that so again putting graphic forms that's what my colleague model calls resolution pharmacology 
when things go wrong, we may be able to add back what's missing, a pro-resolving molecule that will drive the process and have induced resolution and then return of tissue to a new homeostasis. That is perhaps different from this one, but also better than this one. And so this is the process we call resolution pharmacology. You know, Charles Serum in Harvard was a leading figure. Uh, he has focused on the many um, lipid mediators associated with the resolution process. But I want to make a very important point is that resolution of inflammation is much more than the lipid mediators. There are proteins, an XNA1, melanocortin, there are peptides, such as angiotensin 1 to 7. There are other molecules such as short chain fatty acids, H2S, H2O2. So I think there are many drivers of the resolution of, of the resolution process. We do need to find out what these are. You know, there is also a lot of energy that has to be put into finding out the receptors and the signaling mechanisms associated with these molecules. Now, so if we know that resolution of inflammation is an active process because it brings to homeostasis, this obviously brings a new opportunity for therapy that is conceptually different from anti-inflammatory drugs. Because anti-inflammatory drugs, we are mostly thinking of things that will prevent the occurrence. Whereas here we are saying that we are giving something that will normalize something that's already drawn. So resolution of inflammation is more therapy oriented rather than preventive. So, uh, and again, as I showed you at the very beginning, we need the inflammatory response to drive things, to, to have an appropriate immune response. So will these molecules be immunosuppressive or will they favor host response? Now, I don't have a lot of time to discuss all of that. I will just show you that, in, in fact, resolvers of inflammation favor host responses in most instances and are not overall immunosuppressive. In other words, if we ask the question of whether we can use resolution pharmacology to prevent disease, I will show you at the end the answer is yes, right? And that we indeed may be able to develop resolution-based drugs to treat infection. Okay, so as a first example, this has come from a few years ago, studying pneumococcal pneumonia. As you show here, this annexin A1, as I showed you, is a pro-resolving molecule. In the absence of annexin A1, there is more death of animals. And indeed, there is more death because there is a lot more inflammation. When you add a peptide that mimics annexin A1, what you see is that the peptide decreases that excessive inflammatory response. And in fact, that decrease in excessive inflammatory response is not associated with a decrease in ability to deal with a bacterial infection. On the other hand, there is decreased bacterial load. This is because uh, mediators of problem resolution tend to activate macrophages in such a way that it facilitates phagocytosis of bacteria and then killing of phagocytose bacteria. So these initial experiments in, in, in the context of pneumococcal pneumonia will actually say that uh, some pro-resolving molecules uh, favor the ability of the host to deal with bacterial infection because it decreases the inflammatory response, so there is better lung function. And it does so because it facilitates the phagocytosis of the bacteria and hence preventing bacteria is spreading. So what happens in the context of viral infection, because that's the end of the talk, I will focus a little bit more in this context. Uh, and, and this is a model of influenza infection. So we can give uh, a certain amount of the virus, influenza H1N1. So we started this a few years back. Influenza will kill animals. And what happens if you treat during three days? So this is therapy after infection, and you treat for about uh, seven days, what you see is that the drug treatment will prevent a lot of the death associated uh, with influenza. So here we're giving this pro-resolving molecule, angiotensin 1 to 7. And what we see is that there is less death because there is less accumulation of neutrophils in the lung, and hence there is less lung damage. And really interesting, 
is that if anything, you see a lower viral load. And again, this is somehow expected. A lot of the virus need inflammatory signals to survive and infect other cells. Uh, if we look in the lung, what you see is that that neutrophil influx that we see is associated with an overall inhibition of inflammatory score in the lung. And I'm not showing here, this is associated with better lung function. So why is there less inflammation and better lung function in these animals? This is because angiotensin 1 to 7, because it's a pro-resolving molecule, will kill neutrophils by apoptosis. And it's shown here in two different ways. And apoptotic neutrophils are uptaken by uh, macrophages, a process we call aphrocytosis. So neutrophils become dead. They are rapidly taken up by macrophages, and that clears the lung. And that's associated with less than lung damage, better lung function, better infection outcome. Uh, on the other hand, if we remove the receptor for angiotensin 1 to 7, what, you, what we see is a much more severe infection because there is much more, uh, uh, many more neutrophils influxing into the lung, and that's associated with signals that allow the virus to replicate much more intensively. In the absence of the receptor here, if we give angiotensin back, it will not work. They're actually saying that angiotensin 1 to 7 via its mass receptor protects mice from severe influenza infection. Now, this is a, a somewhat more complicated experiment. So here we initially infect with influenza, wait 14 days, and then infect with streptococcus. And this is to mimic what we see, we've seen many years uh, in the 1918 epidemic, is that most people actually did not die of influenza, they die of subsequent bacterial infection before antibiotics were available. So this is, you know, if we infect with a low inoculum of streptococcus, nothing happens. If we infect with this low inoculum after influenza infection, you know, there is 100% death because the bacteria becomes uh, bloodborne. Uh, now, if we treat with angiotensin only during influenza, what we see is that the infection is milder because you contain the ability of the bacteria to go in blood. Pretty much we change uh, macrophage phenotype and we make it better able to deal with the infection subsequently. So we tend to restore to homeostasis much quicker. So this is a message I think it's important and, and it applies to various things is that in this model, at least, administration of angiotensin 1 to 7 favors the ability of the host to deal with severe influenza infection and also favors the ability of the host to deal with a secondary bacterial infection. Uh, again, this is using another pro resolving molecule, uh, which is a peptide derived from the next one. And it, this is in a model of dengue. This is somewhat confusing, but I will drive you to it. If we infect mice with dengue too, there will be thrombocytopenia, hemoconcentration. Hemoconcentration occurs because there is plasma extravasation. And this is associated with, an acute, with a systemic inflammatory response as measured here by the chemokine CCL2 and the mast cell derived MCPT1. Now, if we give, oops, uh, an x one peptide, what we see is that the, the severity of infection is much less severe if we treat with an x one So this is a very short model, so it's very difficult to, to do a therapeutic treatment. But this show that an x one mimetic greatly decreases dengue in wild-type mice, right? Uh, and not only that, if we look in dengue itself, dengue patients, what we see is that dengue is associated with a decrease in the level of this protein. And again, if we actually subdivide dengue patients into severe and non-severe dengue, what we see is the most, more severe you are, 
the less an XNA1 you have. And if we go back to the animal data, we go, we give an XNA1 to, uh, to these animals, they are much better off. So this is to explode the finding. We've done that with several uh, uh, mediators and several infections, is that we have similar results with dengue and beta coronavirus and MHV3 model we've just recently published. We have similar results with like poxna 4 and XNA1, melanocortin, marizin, derivatives. So that actually provides a very strong proof of concept in the context of viral infection. Is that if we enhance, if we give pro-resolving agonists, so the enhancement of pro-resolving pathways prevents disease without affecting infection itself. In other words, we can have, we, 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 we actually are able to contain infection and have an adaptive immune response without excessive inflammation. So it does suggest that in, in humans, resolution pharmacology may be an anti-disease strategy with the advantage, at least in viral infection, it is not viral, you know, virus specific. And so far it be as to be a class effect. So most of the inflammatory pro-resolving molecules we tested have this capacity to prevent viral infection. We need, still need to find out if it, there is an advantage of adding different uh, pro-resolving strategies. And so based on this concept, you know, uh, late last year, we, 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 we thought we could try a, a, a drug, which is AP1189. It is a melanocortin MCTR1 and 3 receptor agonist. It's a biased agonist. In other words, it, 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 uh, it triggers a receptor to drive some of the signaling pathways, but not the cyclic AMP pathway. So although it's melanocortin agonist, it will not change the color of skin, uh, but it is an activator of pro-resolving pathways. So we did a clinical trial in 60 patients uh, with dengue, with COVID. It was a double blind placebo controlled randomized trial. So there was a, a, an open label in six patients so that we could see the safety. So there was interim analysis here focused on uh, safety. If there was an issue, the drug was, is currently being developed for arthritis treatment in phase two. It just completed phase two actually. Uh, the primary efficacy endpoint was time for patients not to need oxygen anymore. So that's what we call time for respiratory recovery. And patients would come in if they were COVID, COVID positive and needed uh, respiratory assistance, meaning oxygen in some sort, but they could not be so severe as, uh, uh, they could not be so late in the disease that there would not be an opportunity for treatment. And they were all taking steroids at the time of study entry. You know, as you can see, uh, most patients were men aged 50 or more. So that was actually in the second wave in Brazil, which we, in which we saw younger patients in the range of 50 years, mostly with some comorbidity, comorbidity that actually explained the, uh, the worst outcome, and most were somehow, maybe not obese, but had a degree of uh, 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 overweight. So they were pretty much my, you know, moderate patients, not the most severe ones that were taking, and they all needed some sort of oxygen. On average, about four to five liters of oxygen. So when we examined this, the administration of this melanocortin receptor agonist decreased time for respiratory recovery by 40%. So control patients needed 10 days to be taken off oxygen, whereas treated patients had a need for six days. And if we look here, most actually, a significant amount, number of patients were actually uh, were released from oxygen very early on. If you look at time for hospital discharge, again, about 3.5 days uh, 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 reduction in time for uh, most patients, you know, a significant number of patients in the treated group actually went uh, home earlier than placebo treated uh, patients. 
that's seen here. So if you look at recovery, discharge at day four, or respiratory recovery at day four, about 50% of patients, treated patients had been uh, recovered. A third were out of the hospital, whereas here, only a third had respiratory recovery, a none were away from hospital as yet. Uh, there were other apparent benefits. So there was less incidence of the need for mechanical ventilation in treated patients and less need uh, for dialysis. So there was less uh, acute kidney injury in treated individuals. And overall, the safety profile was very good. Uh, are not different from placebo. This is an orally driven drug. And at the time, the formulation was a, a, uh, a liquid, which actually caused nausea in significant amount of patients because of the taste of the medication. So in, in conclusion, a pro-resolving molecule significantly reduced time for respiratory recovery by four days. It reduced time for to discharge from hospital by 3.3 days. And it had a very good safety uh, profile. So I will leave you with this, and, and we are working a lot on this at the moment, that resolution pharmacology may be a very effective anti-disease strategy in COVID-19 and other viral infections. There is at the moment no evidence for uh, uh, benefit in other viral infections in humans, but the preclinical data is actually not it's very good, actually. With the advantage, because it's not infection specific, it may be used in a more wider way. So we are at present, you know, finishing the start, you know, the, the regulatory paperwork for phase three studies uh, of AP1189 in COVID-19, and hope to start phase three studies in dengue in March. With that, I, you know, I thank Landa and Vanessa, you know, in the lab, they work in the lab with resolving molecules. They work uh, with Mauro and Thomas allowed us to do the AP1189 work. If somehow, you know, the name of Elisa is not here. Elisa Hayes, my PhD student, who's done all the influenza work. I thank the agencies which support our work. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mauro. It was a really great talk, as uh, anyone could expect. Um, I have a, a few questions already. Uh, the first one is from uh, Josiane Neves, uh, and she actually says, uh, great talk, Mauro. Do you think that it's possible resolution without any kind of remodeling? Because remodeling might mean dysfunction. I would like to hear your thoughts about that. You know, uh, remodeling, you know, we, we have to start thinking about remodeling uh, and separate it from, from inadequate remodeling. You know, if we eat a lot, we remodel our uh, 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 fat tissue and liver. If we think, if we train our brain, we remodel our, our you know, brain. Uh, if we exercise, we, remo we remodel muscles. And, and that is absolutely fine. So remodeling is part of physiology. You know, we need to find the physiological triggers of that, that actually goes all the way to remodeling and maybe back to the new set of, of, of physiological function. So, you know, I think Mark touched on this as he works with this. You know, fibrosis we see in, 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 in IPF, for example, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, is a remodeling that went terribly wrong, right? Yes. In which there is a lot of collagen deposition. So I think remodeling is part of physiology. It's what resolution is there to do. And I think there will be remodeling without deposition of collagen and remodeling with a lot of deposition of collagen that will lead to discussion, destruction of tissue and change of physiological function. And I think these are the things that we need to take care of and try to understand. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Mark, Mark Peters Golden. Uh, thanks for your important talk. Do we understand the intracellular signaling mechanisms or second messengers that can mediate resolution, but which fail to inhibit antimicrobial functions? 
uh, Mark, uh, you know, I, I think to me this is, you know, the field was born out of uh, people interested in finding the mediators and not the signaling. So I think, you know, for many years we were just looking for the mediators, the molecules would, which would do the resolution. You know, in the last five to 10 years, people start looking at the receptors. Now there is so little on the signaling, signal transduction pathways associated with the pro-resolving molecules that I think this is a really important way forward. Uh, uh, you know, from what we've done, we've seen beneficial effects from cyclic AMP uh, associated molecules, uh, but also from molecules which were actually uh, separated or created to avoid enhancing cyclic AMP, right? Uh, there is not a lot of evidence that angiotensin 1 to 7 will increase cyclic AMP in cell types. And that molecular APA 1189, it's biased towards not triggering cyclic AMP and triggering, triggering other things. Uh, uh, so, you know, the, the best answer I can give you is there is a lot, we don't know the signals that separate these two things. And, and I think it's terribly important to do so. Okay, I have uh, a question by Luciana Tavares. Hi, Mauro, she says, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. I wonder whether you guys control the human study for the use of other anti-inflammatory drugs that might be resolution toxic. You know, you don't control clinical studies as you control. <laughs> you know, resolution toxic is, you know, steroids at time can prevent adequate resolution, right? Uh, and that is what some in the area would believe being the non-beneficial effects of, of prolonged steroids, steroidal use. In other words, you know, because you need an active movement of cells to be able to resolve, and you give a cell that pretty much shut down the whole inflammatory process, it will actually prevent adequate resolution. You know, we see less of that in vivo. In fact, you know, in vivo steroids are good pro-resolvers, but that could be molecules that will uh, not allow resolution to occur. You know, it, it, it's difficult. So at the time we did the study, all our patients were taking steroids because that's part of anyone who is, uh, uh, who is doing, uh, uh, who is being treated for COVID at that level of severity. So they should be taking steroids. Uh, most of them will have been taking a, a, an antibiotic again, because in the hostel we were working with, for whatever reason, everyone would be taking steroids until a diagnosis of COVID was confirmed by PCR. And, you know, that would mean that you remove uh, antibiotics away, but that actually takes much longer because the doctors don't usually do that fast enough. They are afraid and think that the antibiotics are great. So you can only control for that afterwards. And we didn't see a difference. So not sure. I, I think it's a, it, it's, it's a fair point she raises, but we can't control that that much. Thank you. Uh, we, we actually have, uh, uh, we are going over time. So I, I'll take the, the opportunity of being chair and ask you uh, one last question. Is that uh, um, these uh, pro-resolution uh, mediators, they, uh, how they affect the, the adaptive uh, immunity that follows and uh, the possible uh, reinfection that uh, may happen with these uh, uh, viral path pathogens? Right. You know, Brun, that, you know, Let's put it this way, when you, when you have influenza or COVID, that's the least worry you have, you know, you oh. want to be alive, right? So in other words, I mean, I'm being very medical here. In other words, if you, if you survive the infection, that's good enough because you can get vaccinated afterwards. But, and again, it's difficult to study that in mice. I think your question is very important. We, we've shown that antibody levels and T cell responses are, are maintained. But you know, mice are so strong at, at, at doing that. They are so effective that I'm not sure how that would translate to humans. We will have to see that, right? Uh, uh, but so far, 
because of the way you facilitate uptake of particles and microorganisms, there is a tendency that's not always significant to enhance at least antigen presentation. Okay? Right. So we don't know how that will set up in the clinic. But in mice, it, it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't change much because they are they are very good at dealing with anti uh, you know viral virus viral infections. All right, thank you, Dr. Teixeira, for a very enlightening talk. It was really great.